All right. So today we're going to deal with the question, part three, of how will the world see the church, see Christ through the church? We this is the third part in this little series, um, and and asking this question. And one of the realities that we get to deal with today is that um, the world will see Christ through the church when they see the contrast. Right, when there is a line on the horizon between what a Christian is and what the rest of the world is. They will see and know that Jesus Christ is alive when they see your life transforming inexplicably, wonderfully, whimsically into the image of Jesus Christ. I say whimsical because oftentimes what happens with Christians is we kind of get real stiff and rigid about who we are and what we're allowed to do. And we have these hardline morals. This isn't a moral teaching. This is a spiritual teaching. This is a teaching that calls you to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit speaks in your life and respond accordingly, to be simply tender and malleable, able to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. The world will see Jesus when they witness our transformation out of these moralistic kind of feel-good Christians into spiritually whimsical, joyful, happy, even when circumstances aren't good. There's a joy and happiness that is in the life of the believer that carries us through times of grief and sorrow. The happiness may be um, faint at times. The joy is never absent. Even in times of deepest grief, we find ourselves hopeful and joyful because of what Jesus Christ did, because of what he called us to do. So here's the reality. The contrast makes it better. The contrast between the church and the world or you and your former self is so important. And we understand this because if we never change, if you come here and you never change, then you have chosen the worst hobby in the history of the world. Let me tell you what your hobby, church, asks of you. We want you to give 10% of your income. We want you to bake cookies and then not eat them, but give them to us on Sundays. We want you to come sit in an overcrowded building. We want you to be a part of a small group and open your life up and take risks emotionally and spiritually. We want you to invest your life here for the purposes of the kingdom, and it's very costly to you personally. That's called a horrible habit, hobby, or something if it doesn't involve transformation into Jesus' name. In Jesus' image. If you're just doing church to feel better, there's, you're not going to feel better. Church is not a religious activity to salve the soul. Church is the living body of Christ becoming our old self, becoming more like Jesus Christ. We need to understand that if we never change, we are really bad at choosing hobbies. The church is called to become like Christ. Here's the way I look at it. Um, this is one of Chip and JoJo's houses. I look at that one on the left, and I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what I look like spiritually some days. You're like, I bet there's a skeleton in there somewhere, most likely under the floorboards, because a creeper lived there, right? And then you look at the next house, and you're like, oh, that's kind of lovely. I would like to sit next to that fire and, I don't know, drink cocoa. I don't know if I'm six today or what, but that's what I would drink. And I would sit next to that fire in that fireplace, and you have this beautiful kind of deck up top, and it's beautiful. It's completely transformed. If you pulled up to the house on the left, you'd be like, no, I don't want to look at that. That's scary. You pull up to the house on the right, and you're like, I'd pay a lot of money to spend a night there. I'd love to spend the rest of my life in a place like that, right? It's transformed from what it was into what it what it's supposed to be. Someone with vision took over it. Someone with vision wants a part of your life. The Lord Jesus Christ has a vision for you. Transformation is just downright enchanting. We love to see people transform. We love to see people get better. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn in to the Apostle Paul's writing in Ephesians uh, chapter 5 verses 1 to 20. I'm going to read these. Please uh, follow along on the screen as I do. It says this, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, Christians, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. 
Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talking, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather there should be thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Disobedient means you know the truth and you live different than it calls you to. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once, do you notice this? Not once in darkness, but you were once darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord, having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish. But understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you think like, man, that doesn't sound like fun to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and really sing with all your heart. Have you ever been in your car and your song comes on? And you're like, to the people around me, my condolences. It goes up and you just like, um, I'm about to have at it in this car. I might even roll the windows down because I got to sing. And you realize like you're singing and you're like, oh, my eyes were closed. Oh, my goodness. You know, you're just into it. You really get into it. We as the church are literally like the living stanzas of a song. We are things that are supposed to draw people in and be engaging to the world. They want to participate and learn the words of what's going on in our life. Why? Because we changed the world. Christianity changed the world. And I want you to hear this today because our culture is screaming at you and I. And it's time, maybe not to scream back, but to talk pretty forcefully today. We're going to talk for a few minutes about how Christianity changed the world. How Ephesus the third largest city in the Roman Empire, was a place of debauchery and sin that Las Vegas feels jealous of. They took part in things that would not only make you and I blush, but it would absolutely horrify and break our hearts. And they did so in a way that just kind of boggles the American and modern mind. But here's some of what went on. Infanticide. They would kill their babies. Almost constantly, if you were of a family in standing, there were places where you could just bring your babies and drop them by an obelisk in the, in, in the cities, a place of worship, and just drop them. And the babies would cry until their cry went out, and then the, they would die, exposed in the sun to the elements. There was infanticide everywhere, the child abandonment. There was abortion, the killing of innocent life because people didn't want to be inconvenience. There was human sacrifice. They literally sacrificed humans in the ancient world to please the gods. Suicide was celebrated. All of these were common and they were condoned by the culture without guilt or remorse. Some of these were even celebrated. Adultery was rampant. Rampant. Sexual immorality everywhere. Prostitution was actually a form of worship in the temple of Diana. So you could go and you could do inappropriate things in the temple with some, you know, temple prostitute. And it was good. It was celebrated by the culture. Homosexuality, pedestry involving children in it. Other sexual sins were seen with no religious, moral, or social stigma. And they were practiced legally and widely throughout the Roman Empire. Romans hated Christians. They hated Christians so much that the word Christian became a swear word. And they hated them to the point of persecution, murder, torture, and imprisonment for Christians. Why? Not because Christians made them feel guilty, but Christians wouldn't 
condone what was going on in the culture. Christians would not condone it. And when people love darkness, they hate the light. Christianity didn't sit and speak out against these things. They just didn't condone it. They lived lives that were transformedly different than the culture around them. And culture hated them for it. What we recognize is that that's the world the gospel came into. And I was as vague as possible, but imagine the worst that you can imagine and bring it to life and realize how dark, evil, and sinful this world was. The world of Ephesus, Rome, Alexandria, and the outlying great cities of the Roman Empire. But then there's this transformation that takes place. The world begins to transform. In between 300 and 400 AD, this emperor named Constantine comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people say he came to Christ out of political motivations, but that's not so. The Roman emperor identified himself as a Christian by 300 AD. And Christians shone brightly like the stars on a dark night into the darkness of the Roman Empire. And the contrast between their lives and the other lives was obvious. They follow God's example, as Paul says in verse 1 of this. Therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering. They lived that out. And the transformation of culture was crazy. They made the most of every opportunity. They saw their opportunity to shine the light of Christ, and they did it fearlessly. Actually, they did it courageously, probably terrified. They were probably terrified of what was coming to them, but they did it courageously. They shined the light of Christ. Here's a few of the things that Christians did to push back on culture. They buried people's dead. In the Roman world, if you were poor and you you died, they would probably just incinerate you. They'd burn you. They'd throw you on a pile of garbage, and that's where your final resting place would be, to decompose there. Christians began to bury the dead for those who couldn't afford it. And they spoke to the dignity of human life and the need to grieve and celebrate what was, but also to, to mourn what was lost. They rescued abandoned children, And they cared for the sick and elderly, which was not a Roman moral ethic. Christians invented hospitals. Did you know that? Hospitals, the word hospitality, Christians showed hospitality to the sick, to the weary, to the dying. And they created hospitals. That's why many of our hospitals are called St. Jude's, St. Mary's, different Catholic names around it. Why? Because Christians invented hospitals. They invented the care of the sick. Instead of seeing that someone was sick and throwing them aside because they were no longer of cultural value, Christians actually invested more into them. They invested more into them. It's frightening to think that before Christians in hospitals, the sick and the elderly and the weak were just pushed off to the margins to die out of sight because it was inconvenient for the culture around them. They cared for people with disabilities. They were the first major people group to do that, to care for those who had disabilities. It was the first Christians who elevated women from the status of chattel property. Women were property in the Roman Empire and the ancient world. You were owned by a husband. Christians are the first people to elevate women to equal status and live into the biblical ethic of a man being created and God taking a rib from his side and fashioning woman And he took it from his side so that she was his equal, not from his head that she would rule over him and not from his foot that he would rule over her. But a woman was raised up by early Christians to be an equal in the kingdom of God. They had dignity and they did just as Christ did in that. They obeyed the Lord and served one another out of love and their contrast to the pagan broken world of Ephesus, Rome, Alexandria was so evident, it stood so far apart from that culture and people looked and they thought, I don't want that because the reality is one day I am gonna get old, I am gonna get sick and I don't wanna be pushed off to the garbage heap of humanity and forgotten. I want to be remembered. I want to be cared for. I want someone to love me. 
And what we need to recognize as the church alive in Christ Jesus is the call to you and to me is to make the most of every opportunity that we are given and to understand that when we are Christians and we name ourselves Christians, we must not be willing to be just another shade of gray in the culture that doesn't contrast with what's going on. The church is not only not able to participate in the culture fully, but it definitely must stand in stark contrast to it by the value we place on human life from the unborn to the elderly and every phase in between, from the resident to the alien in our gates. We must be people who value the God-given life that bears the image of God on every human being. We must be willing to stand in opposition to bodies politic and bodies finance that try to define what success and value is. And we must stand up and be the ones to give a full-throated call back to culture that says, not so when it comes to who matters and who doesn't. We cannot sit back any longer and pretend that our role in modern-day Rome isn't critical. This church must be a shining light, not of how good you are, but of what he's done. And I speak this as emphatically and forcefully as possible so that you hear and understand we are not joking about the gospel. It is the one hope of humanity. And we bear it and we don't want to hurt people's feelings around us because, well, I mean, they're pretty messed up and I don't want them to feel bad. Maybe feeling bad would cause them to realize that something's missing. It is not love to pat somebody on the back and say it's okay and send them on their way to hell unknowing. When you have the gospel living inside of you, we must be people who are willing to take risks. And if you want to know how scared and adverse we are to risk, small groups. Like, I can't risk it. I've been hurt before. Trust me, I've worked in the church a long time. I've been a human pinata at times. And I'm here. Sometimes, like when we started this church, I wanted to run away. Like it was on fire. I was scared to death. I was broken and hurt. But it doesn't change the fact that the high calling of the church is to display Christ well so that the world can see a contrast between their ethic and Christ's. And Christ's ethic values every human being, every opportunity to share the gospel. The gospel believes that there is none so evil and reprehensible that they can't receive forgiveness from Christ. The only way they'll believe that we know that, that, that that is true is if we live it with some sense of urgency and passion. For as Paul said, the days are evil. So here's what I want to do. I want to take a minute and I want to apply this. And I want you to look at this word with me and think, why would I want you to be thankful today? Why is thankfulness an antidote for this culture? Because this culture, like the Roman culture, Thankfulness is Paul's remedy for greed, sexual immorality, and impurity. It's a thankful heart, a heart that knows I don't have everything, but I do have enough, and for that I bless God. Someone who lives with enough, not always craving more and craving to take more from people who maybe don't have enough, but thankfulness. When we do not look at God, when we don't look to God as our source of transformation, as our source of life, and as the high calling to which we are to be transformed into, when we don't look at God, we try to satisfy ourselves with material and immoral things. When your eyes lose focus on God, you begin justifying, like I do, every form of sin and impure behavior because, well, it'll make me feel better. We make idols out of things, out of sex. Our culture is saturated with sexuality. We've got kids struggling with pornography across the spectrum from elementary school on up. Why? Because they have Snap, because they have Insta, because they have Twitter, because they have all these things that have freely uploaded access to immoral things. And parents, we've got to own up to the fact that we've been scared to see what's on our kids' phones, so we just pretend we raised them right. That's not enough. 
We have to be thankful for the opportunity to be parents and to lead children and thankful for the opportunity to invade their space and guard and protect those who are not yet old enough to filter right and wrong. It's not easy, but it's true. We make idols of things, our own appetites. That's why there's the food network, the cooking network, the network for food, the, all these things. Why? Because we just want more, more, more. We'll just take, take, take constantly. It's never enough. John D. Rockefeller started the trend. We've carried it on well. When the reporter asked, how much is enough? And he said, just one dollar more. Just one dollar more. We make idols out of things. And here's the reality. Those things become the masters we serve, bound in our own sin. But we should be thankful to God. And we should live with our eyes on him, realizing he didn't leave us according to our sins, but he redeemed us with Jesus Christ, life, death, and resurrection. And not only did he redeem us, he called us upwards and forwards into his life to live as he lived, not by our own moral behavior, but by his Holy Spirit. When our eyes are on God, we worship and serve him with a thankful heart rather than be feeling begrudging at what we can't participate in. The second thing and the second reality is, what does your before and after look like? Like if you were a house, what did it look like? What's your before and after? Is your life a shining transformation or does it look like every other life around you? I can't answer that for you. But as Christians today, we are constantly, slowly conforming to the morals and the ethics of this world. We have shows like 13 Reasons on Netflix that does what the Roman Empire did. They glamorize suicide. They glamorize it. They blame everyone else, and it's this dark, twisted thing. Do you know it was a really cool thing in Roman society? Emperor Nero, the most pagan of all Roman emperors, killed himself and said as he went, today the world loses its greatest artist. And he kills himself thinking people will grieve his loss. And we romanticize these things in our cultures. Romans love the idea of 13 reasons. We celebrate every kind of sexual sin in our culture. When I hear that 50 Shades of Grey is burning its way across the women of the church, part of me just wants to curl up. Because that is as much debauchery and evil as you can pour into pages. And we've got women in the church thinking it's no big deal, it's just my little thing. We cannot celebrate sexual sin. We cannot celebrate things that break the heart of God. We can't look like the rest of the world. We can't sit on our phones and scroll through images and different things and celebrate all kinds of sexual sin and think, it doesn't apply to me. I only do it in private. Trust me, what we do in private, the light will shine. These behaviors do come out. We have to look at life as it is. We have to recognize that even in our culture, the world is hating Christians for their morals for their moral beliefs. We have bakers who are absolutely bankrupt because they don't feel morally they can bake a cake for a same-sex couple. And they don't want to, so they say no, and they get sued. And no Christian stands up and says, yeah, I mean, don't they have the right to choose? Not to be discriminatory or hateful, but, but to say, are we hated for believing that there is sin in the world? Will this church be far emptier next week because we speak on it and we hate the idea of living to God's standard, not ours? And then we devalue human life. We devalue human life through sex trafficking and we pretend it's not going on in our own midst. And maybe we'll do a little something to change it, but we don't feel compelled to change. We don't actually change, not in our own power, but we don't let the Holy Spirit shine in our life the things we're doing that contribute to this brokenness. We as the church fail miserably with abortion, not because we value human life, but because we don't value the moms who are struggling with a decision. We just wait for them to make a mistake and then we scream murderer instead of walking alongside people who are in the toughest of circumstances. We have to recognize and understand that our lives should look different. We should take stands on things that always value one thing, the God-given life to each and every one of us in this room and in this world who have the image of God born into us. We have to be willing to be done looking like this culture and living, we have to start living like Jesus Christ did. Well outside the boundaries of culture and hated by it at times, 
but for one thing, to give a contrast to the world so that they can see Christ through the church. The third and final thing is this, just a personal look in. Is there anything you excuse in your life in order to be entertained, included, or relevant? What do you allow to entertain you? What do you allow in your life so that you're included and not isolated? What do you allow in your life so that your life seems relevant to the world around you? I can't answer that question for you, but I can tell you this. Church, we better answer the question. We better look to God and find the answer to the question of these things. Because if we are entertained by things that break the heart of God, we need to understand he's not entertained. He called us according to his purposes, not our desires. And I'm sorry if this feels heavy-handed today. But the reality is the church has to hear that the world is supposed to see Christ through us. And if there's no distinction between you and I and the world, then what are we doing? What are we doing? So I'm going to invite you to something. I'm going to invite you back to Jesus. Not back to my moral standard. Not back to what I think is right. But I'm going to invite you to take a moment with me here and ask a question. God, will you call me out to you? Remember the story of Peter in the boat when Jesus was walking on the water? And he said, Lord, if that's you, you call me to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter's like, no way. Over the gun wall he goes, right? Walking out to Jesus. Jesus will call you out into that great unknown. It won't be easy. It won't be comfortable. There will be storms raging around you. But if you keep your eyes fixed on him, the Lord over the storm, the God who's redeeming culture through your broken life. You won't sink. You will be a living contrast witness to this culture. And people over time will see that your life does indeed speak a truth that values them, just as God does. It's a challenge and an invitation. Just ask him, God, if it's you, will you call me to follow? That's what discipleship is. Come, follow me. Become like me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we confess corporately as a church. We often do a lot of things to, to try to appeal to the world. And in many ways we have failed and we have willingly participated in things we shouldn't have. But we also, God, know that this isn't the end of the story for us, corporately and individually that there is a challenge and a calling going out to us from you that says, come with me, get away with me, and that you will give rest to our weary souls, our souls that have sought to find satisfaction in this world but found it wanting. God, may we run to you. May we get out of the safe known of the boat and follow you into the chaotic waters of this life to live a life of wild abandon from the security of all we know into the arms and the hands of him who knows us. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. Your church eagerly waits to hear the words, come. So we ask, would you call us, even as we spend a moment calling out to you, asking the question, if it's you, Lord, bid me come. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, please stand, sing it.